Hello everybody, this is Zach. I'm on a solo episode today. It is just I. And I want to talk about something that I pretty regularly hear about and uh, am often uh, sort of thinking about in my own career and how I've progressed. And that question is, how do I get into emergency management? And then we're also going to talk about uh, how do we build an emergency management program. Uh, I think the there's a lot of sort of discussion about the development of emergency management in the context of like large agencies, large cities, uh, you know, where there's multiple people. But for a lot of us that were out in the field, uh, we are in shops of one, two, maybe like up to 10 people, like 10, like in, in, in my experience, I, I've worked in several agencies uh, and the state of Vermont was the biggest one that I was a part of. And uh, as far as like sort of direct emergency management EOC personnel, you know, still pretty small. So I had to get creative in how to um, manage incidents as well as uh, sort of build out my system to account for uh, not having the resources of a larger agency. So that's something we'll also talk about. Uh, first, let's go to ads and we'll be right back. The Readiness Lab is bringing back dynamic populations attack at the stadium. Join us in Orlando, Florida from November 29th to December 1st. All EM Weekly listeners can save 5% off the registration by using EM Weekly as a discount code at checkout. How do you spell Doberman Emergency Management? EOP, OEP, HVA, HNP, Thyra, TTX, Drone, PDA. Whenever you need an expert, Doberman Emergency Management field experts are there for support. Contact an expert at DobermanEMG.com today. Also, as one of you, you heard uh, the ad, um, we have the DIPOP uh, training coming up. That would be a great opportunity for you to get uh, some sort of face time with people of various skill sets and, and uh, types of agencies they belong to. You should definitely attend. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be in Orlando. Uh, so join. Just go. Like We'd love to have you there. Um, all right. So first and foremost, how do you get into emergency management? One of the worst trends in emergency management right now is the extreme requirements for getting hired into an emergency management program. There are so many uh, postings that I see that are requiring a master's degree uh, for entry level and then paying a salary of like uh, uh, an associate's degree. Uh, so first and foremost, if you're on a hiring committee or you're in the uh, hiring process, uh, please, the salary needs to be commensurate with your requirements. So if you're asking for 10 years of experience and a master's degree, you better be paying for 10 years of experience or a master's degree. And the other reason I bring this up is not just because it's difficult for people who are just breaking into the field. Uh, you're also not going to find candidates because there's a lot of um, private sector and federal agencies that are, are now opening up tons and tons of positions, and they're going to pay a lot better than a lot of these uh, smaller public safety agencies. So either you need to be realistic in your expectations or you need to pay up. So uh, just please, like, it, don't gatekeep, don't make this insane. Um, CEM is also a requirement for a lot of um, entry-level positions that I've noticed. And that's just not something a lot of people are gonna have uh, coming into this field. And the reason is you gotta build experience somehow, right? So. In the past, uh, the path to emergency management was often through first response. So you were a firefighter, an EMT, or a police officer, and you kind of find this field that looks interesting and doesn't require you to get dirty uh, or hurt or tired. Uh, the shifts seem a little bit better. You kind of have a nine to five schedule for the most part. Um, and so that was often the path. Uh, to basically get into emergency management, you just had to like take some extra ICS courses. It's a little bit more complicated now, uh, and in some ways that's really good because the field is sort of uh, coming into its own and doesn't need you to sort of have that response background. Um, but because of that, it can be a little bit more challenging to get that experience. So some of the best ways to sort of build out your resume and start to build that experience is to start with a volunteer organization if you if you don't have one an internship or volunteer organization so i interned uh during my undergrad uh, i interned with the campus emergency management uh person who was actually part-time it was uh bill ballard who was the vice president of admin and facilities 
Uh, he was basically doing it as a passion project, and I discovered it uh, thanks to, I'm going to give another shout out, J.B. Betancourt, who is now a doctor. Uh, but at the time, he was uh, a crew chief on the University of Vermont Rescue Squad. I was on UVM Rescue. I looked out the window, and for some reason, he had this cruiser that had, uh, it looked like a state police cruiser, but it had red lights on it. And I was like, what is that? And he goes, oh, I'm a state duty officer for Vermont Emergency Management. And I was like, what is emergency management? That took me down this whole path. I started asking around. I was like, how do I get into emergency management? I had an amazing advisor, Dr. Uh, Dupini Giroux, uh, who is awesome. She's a state climatologist for Vermont. She had all these connections and had been working in emergency management. Uh, by the way, as you're seeing here, network is also critically important. Start handing out business cards or introducing yourself, all that stuff. This network uh, is what built me. So Dr. Leslie Ann Dupini Giroux, uh, one of my favorite people in the world, uh, was like, hey, uh, you should talk to Bill Ballard. He does emergency management for campus. I've worked with him before. Uh, I bet we can get an internship in place. Talk to Bill. He hooked me up, and I started working on plans. It just so happens that that was the year that H1N1 was occurring, aka swine flu. So I got to help write the plans for a pandemic, um, which, long story short, uh, I eventually became the full-time emergency manager there, and got to dust off plans that I helped write, uh, you know, almost a decade earlier, which was really cool. Um, they'd been updated, but uh, so anyways, I got to do that internship, got to build a, a lot of experience there because Bill was uh, essentially doing it part time. So he kind of left it to my own device. He's like, hey, listen, we need a lot of stuff like go nuts um, and started working with um, a few other people on campus that were involved in this, Al Turgeon and a few others. I'm just shouting names out so that everyone, uh, you know, I can give them their, their due credit for helping me get into what I did. Um, from there, I was like, well, I really want to do uh, weather stuff. So Dr. Dupini Giroux being the um, state climatologist, she's like, all right, well, if you want to do emergency management weather, you got to talk to the National Weather Service. The National Weather Service at the time wasn't really super integrated into like ICS and emergency management stuff. Um, you know, obviously they provided tons of information, but I think like IMETs were still relatively like, uh, I, like there wasn't a lot of them. Um, we happened to have one in our local office. So I applied to, to help, uh, in any way I could as an intern. And they said, well, uh, normally we take meteorology students, but since UVM doesn't have a a meteorology school, like, sure, like, come on over. I was a geography, that was the other thing. So I was a geography major. Geography is a great degree to get into emergency management. It's super broad. You can kind of focus on a lot of different things. So I did GIS and geospatial um, analysis stuff um, and then focus really on sort of like climate and disaster and uh, how I could use GIS and, and satellite, you know, remotely sensed uh, data to sort of like make sense of it all, um, which came in really handy. Another quick shout out, GIS. Just start working in GIS. If you don't know what GIS is, Ge Geospatial Information Systems, you can download QGIS for free. Uh, start using that system. Get familiar. Even if you can't figure out QGIS, get on to, uh, you know, just use like Google Earth Professional. Start learning that stuff. Mapping is critical in emergency management. It gives you a, a leg up automatically. Um, so... As I sort of got experience in that, I got to go work for the National Weather Service. Again, made lots of uh, great experience, uh, great connections and experience there. Um, you know, Greg, Scott, uh, oh God, there's so many people there. I'm going to draw blanks. The National Weather Service in, in Burlington uh, was just so super helpful. Um, and all of those uh, folks there, like, they were excited because I wasn't a meteorologist. So they're like, oh, cool, this is like a new thing. Um, and what I ended up doing was mapping. Uh, tornado reports um, that uh, didn't match their warning criteria. So if we were, not just tornado reports, uh, severe weather. So if they got a damage report for something, and this system has completely changed now, it's much, much more uh, accurate. But back then, they didn't really have a, a sort of database where they were like correlating this stuff. Like, did this warning, you know, uh, capture all of the damage? Like, you know, so they have to do these these annual analysis to see how accurate their forecasts were. And they knew they were missing stuff because a lot of that, uh, a lot of their data is, is done by radar and, and Vermont being very hilly and mountainous, um, we have a lot of blind spots for our radar. So uh, they will capture stuff from, uh, you know, actually what they used to do is call the local post office and say, hey, look outside. Does it look like anything's busted or the town garages? Because uh, they know that the storm was headed that way. And then there's like this blank thing. So I started helping building a, a geospatial database to, to do that. 
So again, another thing I realized was, okay, I, I know GIS is super beneficial and I know having a weather background is super beneficial. Um, so now I'm already building out my experience. Uh, I ultimately, I graduated. Vermont had zero professional <laughs> like emergency management opportunities. Uh, at the time, the only real professional emergency management roles were through the state. Um, and they were not as well funded at that time because we hadn't really been walloped by anything in a while. Uh, Tropical Storm Irene would eventually fix that. So I followed my wife, uh, girlfriend at the time, over after we both graduated from the University of Vermont, we went to Clinton County, New York, uh, to Plattsburgh, where she was doing her master's in um, education. And I took a hiatus from emergency management, worked in advertising for my father-in-law for a little bit. Uh, I should also caveat this. I was a firefighter EMT this entire time. So I've done volunteer fire stuff since I was 17 Putney Fire, Shelburne Fire, and now I moved on to Plattsburgh, uh, South Plattsburgh Fire. So I did have a, a benefit in that. I also took a little bit of time between high school and college and worked in law enforcement. Um, that helped me because of where emergency management was. I don't know if that would be as big a help now. Um, I mean, having the, the response background, certainly, uh, you know, you kind of walk the walk, um, which is handy. Uh, but again, there's other means through it. So as I sort of progressed in my career, uh, I, I was like, well, now what? I've graduated. I'm kind of working in advertising. Uh, and I was doing some stuff on the side. I was still doing volunteer fire stuff, but I really was interested in emergency management. Something about it was just like so cool. And it took a lot of the stuff I liked about fire and EMS and law enforcement. Um, but I got to deal with bigger problems. I think that was kind of like the fun part. And so I was trying to figure out what do I do here? So I was still in the fire department um, and I reached out to the Red Cross because like everyone, like when you're seeing a disaster, you think Red Cross, like they do a lot of stuff. So I was like, hey, this is what I wanna do. Uh, do you have anything uh, I can help with? And they said, absolutely. We have something called a government liaison. And so I started volunteering with the Red Cross as a government liaison. And a couple things happen. Uh, first was we had a lake flooding event where we had this prolonged, I mean, like months long uh, lake flooding event that uh, actually caused a very significant um, mass care crisis. And so we had to house a lot of people for a very long period of time. And these were very um, high needs individuals with a lot of medical, mental health. Um, there was some hoarding issues. Uh, so they were just, they were really vulnerable. They were really sort of down and out. So we were trying to build this shelter and I got to learn all about mass care. Um, and it was like, I, you know, I was kind of thrown into the fire. I didn't really know what I was doing. So in that time I got to work with, um, Clinton County, uh, office of emergency services and, um, Eric Day, Kelly Donahue, more shout outs, again, building my network. Uh, they were like, Hey, uh, we've never really had a, a Red Cross person that does this. Like, you should help us out in other ways. And I was like, anything I can do, please let me know. So I was really sort of like working with them, building my uh, disaster experience, learning a lot about mass care uh, at this time, because that was what we had congregate uh, housing, we had congregate feeding, um, and this went on for months. So we had to figure out, you know, just how do you staff something for that long? Uh, then Irene hit, and that's sort of like, that was our big you know, uh, uh, I like to talk about like left of boom and right of boom. Like Vermont had been left of boom for so long and even Northern New York had been left of boom for so long that we weren't really prepared for how bad it could be. And Irene uh, was like a punch in the face. Uh, fortunately, loss of life was relatively low, um, but the destruction was like unreal. Um, we lost just every transportation system in the state. Uh, we had communities that were isolated, like completely cut off for a long time. So. All this stuff is happening. I'm building more and more experience. Um, and then I was like, all right, I'm going to try to get some master's. So I, I entered a master's program for leadership uh, leadership and administration. Um, and I'm sort of building out my like professional leadership abilities. Um, and magically, a position opened up at the um, Vermont Emergency Management, uh, which there was, again, there was not that many positions. And a lot of those folks had been there for a long time. And I got in... Um, and spent uh, almost two years there, uh, really liked it. There was a bunch of shifts in the organization and my role kind of shifted away from what I really wanted to do. So um, 
but I got to do some really cool stuff. Got to do some of the GIS stuff. That was one of the reasons they, they wanted me there was because they didn't have a GIS uh, program. And then in that role, I actually got some experience uh, with the University of Vermont Spatial Analysis Lab, which was someone I had worked for as an undergrad. So that was how I was building my GIS uh, skills, uh, working for the Spatial Analysis Lab. Well, they got a, contra or a, um, a grant to work with the US Department of Transportation doing a federal drone, pro drone program. And I was like, this is it, like this is the future. So this was probably like 2013, 2014. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. Uh, I wanna get in this. I worked on that program for two years with Jarlath O'Neill Dunn, another huge uh, important person in my professional network. Um, and we basically learned how to move from satellite, uh, you know, huge regional uh, data down to, you know, fixed wing data down to drone data. So uh, what we were really trying to figure out was uh, volumetric estimation. Like, how do you figure out uh, so in, in the case of Irene, we had all these roads washed out when that happens. Now, all of a sudden, everyone's trying to compete for resources to repair those roads and you have limited amount of like material. So how do you quickly, uh, track that, uh, and then build a, um, you know, a, a sort of picture of how much stuff you need without either stealing from your neighbors who also need it. Um, and then also not taking so long to come up with uh, your, your information that you miss out and, and you don't get the stuff that you need. Um, and so we just started figuring all this stuff out. Um, and uh, one of the, the things that happened while I was at the state of Vermont was we also had Hurricane Sandy that went through. And Hurricane Sandy, uh, or not Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, extratropical, stand, whatever you want to call it. There was a lot of different names, uh, but Sandy came through. Uh, Vermont was like, oh, we can't do what we did with Irene. Um, we had learned a lot of lessons, and that was only a few years earlier. Um, and so when Sandy came through, all of a sudden we started bringing in all these other resources. I got to work with like the federal, um, one of the IMAT teams, and I was like, this is also really interesting. Started meeting people in the IMATs and, and learning about that. Um, and then progressed into the eventually, like you know, like I said, I joined that that uh, spatial analysis program full time um, after a couple of years at the state uh, because I was like, this is like the future. I want to be a part of the future, um, and got to do all sorts of really really cool stuff with them, including things like uh, we had this because of Vermont's. Uh, you know, landscape and, and our weather, we have these training thunderstorms, just thunderstorm after thunderstorm after thunderstorm will go through and it'll flood an area really, really rapidly, like just dump eight inches of rain, you know, over a couple of hours, just these storms just coming through. And so we get these really crazy rapid uh, flash flood events and they, because of the hilly terrain, it all kind of goes through this area. We were doing things like studying, um, the watershed to understand like how water moves through and how debris is there. And so we were flying drones over this, this community in Plain, it's called Plainfield. It's a small town, but they get flooded a lot and they had this bridge that got destroyed and all this stuff. And they're like trying to figure out what do we do next? So there was a period of time where everyone's like, well, we just dredge the whole river system and streams and everything. And, and that way we don't have to worry about it. Well, we're like, well, if you do that, you're not really solving the problem. You're actually making the next town downstream, uh, they're gonna have even faster water, what's gonna cause worse damage for them. And they're like, well, then we'll remove the debris. So we flew drones over this area just over and over and over for months. And we had a couple of storm events that went through and we could actually tell, okay, if you went through and you pulled all the debris out of this, uh, this stream, uh, guess what? It's all gonna be back there probably in a week. And that stuff naturally gets moved anyways. And based on what we can sort of tell, uh, and I, they've done more research on this. So, um, you know, I'm talking from like my very cursory, uh, I was more of the tactician uh, in this role. Um, but they ultimately um, were able to basically figure out that the debris was good, don't remove it, um, and move the bridge around. So that's that was the solution. But got to work with them until their grant ran up. And then the University of Vermont was like, hey, we have a full-time position for emergency manager. Do you want to do this? And I was like, absolutely. All right, so now if you you've, that's my career path. Basically, volunteer, do this stuff. Cert teams, you know, you can do volunteer cert, uh, races, which is the um, amateur radio emergency stuff, um, or you can create your own local program. There's there's a lot of really cool programs. Somebody commented um, on one of our posts uh, this morning and said that they built this like community uh, communication system. They've got all their folks uh, getting ICS trained, and these are just you know civilians who live in Northern California. They're trying to build their program. Um, 
So start with volunteers, start with internships, um, you know, reach out to your local agencies, especially the, the smaller agencies, so your town, your county, uh, they probably don't have enough people to do what they wanna do. They may have reserve opportunities, they may have, um, you know, the, the small teams on the side. Um, you know, amateur radio is a way in, you can get your amateur radio license, uh, it's fairly easy, I think I got mine in like a weekend, um, you just take, they have courses, you can do it for a longer time if you're not like sort of technically proficient, I had a little bit of an electronics background. Um, so all those ways are great. Um, get some time in, in the in the EOC, so like a county or, or a city, if they have an EOC during an emergency, they need to staff that, become a volunteer, get connected, network, 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 network. Um, you can network through local emergency planning commissions. So a lot of those meetings uh, are open to the public. Um, you can just go there. You know, in a lot of communities, those are those are kind of purely hazardous materials type stuff. But it's still a lot of times you'll have fire departments and other folks there, um, the local emergency managers, as well as like private sector emergency management and risk folks. Um, you may have like emergency management committees. Um, there may be like some, uh, you know, policy development planning stuff. If nothing exists, that's great. So that's kind of what I came into. University of Vermont had no full-time emergency manager. Uh, Bill Ballard had, had done a lot of stuff. They had an, an emergency operations group, which was their EOC team. Um, those were sort of volunteers from other parts of the campus. Um, but they, there was still just like, it was like a, a, a blank slate really. Bill was like, you're, you know what you're doing? Like, I'll help you with whatever you need. Uh, feel free to use whatever's already in place. Uh, feel free to start from scratch. So I just started, you know, looking around. What is it that we need? Um, which, you know, if you have nothing, so you're starting from scratch, which again, uh, it's daunting, but that means that there's just unlimited potential and opportunity there. The first thing you start with is planning and exercising, right? Uh, planning, training, and exercising. So plans first. Like you can't start if you don't have a plan. Like otherwise, you're just spinning your wheels. So. I looked at our emergency operations plan. If your community doesn't have an emergency operations plan, um, or they do what a lot of communities do where they don't have uh, EM help, you know, they just sign off on the plan every year that says this is how you do it. Um, start there. Look at uh, uh, emergency operations plans from other local communities. Uh, try to figure out what your hazards are, what the level of risk is uh, for those hazards. Um, you can see that through a, a, either a Thyra or a local HVA, uh, hazardous vulnerability analysis, and start to build out your plan. Like, what could we do to respond to this? Um, and if your town doesn't have any of that plan, they're, they're going to love you because they need it. Um, so as you start to build out these plans, now you got to figure out, well, what do I do with this? Um, HCEP, the Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program, it is onerous. It is, like, complicated. There's a lot of, like, just extraneous stuff that I don't think you need. However, I will caveat that with, if you have nothing, it is a great starting point. Um, HCEP will help you develop your training and exercise and planning cycle. Um, so it kind of uses the crawl, walk, run approach, and it's also cyclical. Um, and so again, it's going to tell you first, figure out who needs to be there? Like you need to figure out what, what is the, the problem that you're trying to face? Who needs to be in the room and who, what are you trying to write? So you're writing an EOP. Uh, you want kind of everyone in the community to be involved in that. Uh, who's going to have a response or a coordination or any sort of like finger on the, on the plan. So once you have that in place, now you need to get everyone trained up on it. So you'll do your seminars, you'll do your workshops to sort of build out this plan, test it out. Then you can do tabletop and you can keep tabletops really, really simple. Like uh, you know, okay, you got your brand new plan. Um, how are we going to uh, get people into the EOC? How are we going to set up the EOC? What is that communication structure going to look like? Just talk through the problem. So the tabletop have a simple scenario, you know, thunderstorm comes through, destroys a bunch of stuff. Uh, you know, how are we going to do this based on our plan? And then you'll go back, you'll fix your plan through the after action process. Um, my EOPs were always essentially kept in draft form. Uh, they were live. I'm just updating them after every single incident. I do an after action. You know, even if you do something really simple, I like the three up, three down. What three things worked, what three things didn't. Um, that, do, that keeps it from getting overly daunting. So you take those three things that worked, psh, right in the plan. The three things that didn't work, is this stuff that, uh, you know, I need to buy? Is this a process I need to fix? Or is this another plan? 
Sometimes you're like, okay, the EOP actually did pretty well. Turns out it wasn't specific enough, so now we need a functional annex or a hazard-specific annex, and we'll build that out. Uh, we did that for uh, winter weather because, you know, being in northern Vermont, we get lots of weather, and that was a huge issue that the campus continually, like, was just coming up with on the fly. Uh, so yeah, build out your EOP. Then you're going to start doing some drills, figure out like what kind of stuff do you want to test out? You know, notification system, mass notification, uh, huge, 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 uh, tool that has really come into its own over the last like decade. Get super familiar with it. Learn that, um, that can solve a lot of your problems. If you can get people out of the hazard, uh, then you don't have to go in and rescue them. Um, and communication is really important. The faster you're and the better you get at that, uh, the less problems you'll have. Um, you know, so just do things like radio communications, get your local races groups uh, and Aries and, and these other, you know, amateur radio groups. Uh, talk on their, your, um, you know, first response radios, like understand all that stuff. Uh, drill, you know, an evacuation plan, drill a reunification plan, you know, start to get the, mo the wheels turning on these exercises, you know, the functional exercises. And then eventually you work towards a full scale where you try to burn it all down, break everything, uh, test all your stuff out, see how everything works together and coalesces, uh, and then you start over. Um, and if you do that a few times, uh, you know, you start to realize that this becomes a maintenance problem. It's not such a stressful thing. You just, you're building on, uh, on a good foundation. You continuously do that. Now, when you're starting that process, especially if there's nothing in place, uh, you basically just got to get in the room. And so when I first joined, uh, you know, uh, even though my boss sort of oversaw the campus police department, um, because of his other roles, it's not like he could be in there very often to work with them. So they were doing a lot of their own planning and exercising. Um, and, you know, they were doing what kind of cops do. They're focused on like the really tactical, uh, important stuff that was, that they were facing on a daily basis. They didn't have sort of the bandwidth to get into some of the more like 50,000 foot problems. So I came in, started attending their meetings and they're like, who are you? Um, and I, I will say if you, uh, if you carry a notebook around and, uh, you go into a meeting with, uh, a sense of confidence and authority, people won't kick you out. And if you do that enough times, people think that you belong there. So, I just started attending a meetings after meetings after me. Anytime I saw a meeting on a calendar that was like not hidden, I would show up and people started to realize like, oh, hey, this guy's trying to help us out. And uh, I was like, all right, you know, like we're trying to figure out what my role is here. Um, what if I help you with your training and exercise stuff? I have to do that anyways. You guys have to play like let's work together. I did the same thing with the fire department. Now here's where having a first response background helps um, because I already had a relationship through my fire experience. Um, I was able to connect the dots really, really quickly. I knew most of the fire chiefs in the area. Um, I'd worked with them, you know, uh, they were, some of them were my instructors, you know, 15 years ago as I was becoming a firefighter. Um, and so that really, really helped. So there's a check in the pro first response background. Uh, you, you can get a lot of bad habits from first response going into emergency management. So that's the con, but, um, it can be super beneficial. It also, uh, from an emergency management perspective, like sometimes seeing what happens directly boots on the ground, uh, rounds you out a little bit. You realize like, oh, when I make this request and they can't immediately fulfill it, it's not because they don't want to, it's because they're dealing with everything else. Um, so I just started attending meetings again and then I started expanding and I was like, who else has this problem? Like I'm a team of one right now. Um, and I need, uh, help with this. So I was like, all right, well, we have higher ed, uh, campuses around the area. I'm going to start reaching out to those folks. And they're all like, I'm also a team of one and I need help. And so we're like, well, let's work on plans together. Cause essentially an emergency operations plan for higher ed institution, generally kind of the same across the board. And, uh, you know, you have all your specialties and, and specific areas and hazards and stuff you need to focus on. But um, the base plan can essentially be the same. So we started working on stuff together as a there was three campuses right there. Um, Doug Babcock, who's at St. Mike's College, uh, Bruce Bovat, who is at Champlain College. And we're like, well, let's start working together. In that process, we also discovered we had um, some redundancies with doing this. You know, St. Mike's uh, didn't have a huge EOC, um, but they had, you know, a lot of really cool stuff that UVM didn't have. Champlain had no EOC. So they're like, can we use your EOC? And I was like, absolutely. 
Um, and then I was like, well, what happens if like our ESC gets damaged? Can we go up to St. Mike's? And Doug was like, absolutely. Like, we'll, we'll find a space over here. So as we started networking again, networking, 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 uh, we were able to uh, quickly sort of form this network. Uh, that's I'm just saying network over and over. Uh, and then we expanded that. We started actually reaching out to all the hired institutions in the state. Uh, there had previously been a like campus security uh, coalition. We basically just turned that into an all hazards thing. And we started sharing plans. Then I discovered the University and College Caucus through the uh, International Association of Emergency Managers. Uh, and I joined that and I was like, now my network grew from like the local and then the state uh, into this national program. Uh, I started attending uh, the national conference, uh, which was, again, hugely beneficial network-wise. I met people from all across the country. Um, I mean, you would sit down and have meals with, you know, some of the biggest emergency managers in our, you know, industry. And you could just pick their brain. Like, how does how do I do this? How do I do that? Um a lot throughout this process uh, was done through uh, what we like to call R&D uh, in emergency management. R&D is rip off and duplicate. <laughs> so you find someone who has a better plan than you and you uh, basically find and replace your name in there. Uh, if you have nothing, like that's not a best practice, but if you're kind of starting from scratch, uh, don't reinvent the wheel. There's probably someone who's already done it and done a better job. And then you can build off that plan. And then when things are like you run up against a situation maybe you don't have experience with, you don't have anything uh, in your plans or your, your appendices, uh, appendices uh, and you're like, I don't know what to do, I reached out to my network. UCC was like incredibly receptive. They were like down to help with anything. And so I'd get a call from, you know, Eric Hodges out in uh, Illinois who's like, yeah, you're looking for unification plan. We had this huge crisis uh, happen on campus. We had to build this amazing family assistance center plan. Um let me talk you through it. Here's, you know, some templates and stuff to get you started uh, and you're done. Or it's, you know, Stacy at Ohio State, uh, you know, they had an active uh, threat situation. You know, here's how we do the notification. Uh, Michigan State shared this really cool idea that we, we were having an issue during uh, events where we had lots of people from, uh, who weren't from the campus uh, who were, you know, on campus and couldn't figure out where they were and they were having medical emergencies and stuff. And they're like, oh, we just put... Uh, you know, flags up with numbers and colors, and then people just had to identify those during events. It's like, that's so brilliant. Why didn't I think of that? Um, and it's because there's someone who's smarter than me, uh, and they did it already. So uh, at, that's how I sort of built it out. And then uh, I discovered private sector, uh, which is a different world in emergency management. Um, that's what I'm in now, obviously, uh, through Doberman Emergency Management. Um, and now I get to sort of take all of this, you know, over a decade of emergency management and, you know, God, I'm getting old, almost two decades of uh, first response experience and uh, just get to help other people figure this out. So if you really start from scratch and you don't know what to do, the private sector emergency management community has grown uh, pretty significantly. You can hire folks like us to come in and, and help build that out if you're, if you're really struggling and, and isolated. Um, or you just need to fast track it. Like you don't have time to sort of like, you know, spend 10 years to build a program. Um, but ultimately out of this entire conversation, what benefited me was uh, networking with lots and lots of people, saying yes to every opportunity that I could. And obviously that depends, like, you know, I was young, I didn't have a family, so I was basically really flexible and could do whatever I wanted to. Um, but saying yes uh, to challenges, uh, it kind of puts you in a situation where you have to respond to it and you kind of have to succeed. And I did that. And that hugely benefited me. Um, and then just do it. Like, just do it. Like, if you don't have a, an emergency management role and no one in your community is helping you, and I know this is a situation that many people have because I see it on LinkedIn all the time, people posting, like, I'm at my wits end. Um, you know, just reach out to people and say, like, you know, how, how can I do this? What do I need to do? Um, and if if you're not getting any responses, you know, call up your your mayor's office or your, you know, your fire department, police department, say, hey, I'm trying to build experience writing emergency plans. Uh, I know that there's not an emergency plan for this. Can I or there is one, but it hasn't been touched in 20 years. Can I just help you rewrite this? I, I would be shocked if anyone is like, absolutely not, because writing plans for first responders is the, they hate it. Like, it's just not something they want to do. Um, they got all the other stuff they have to worry about. 
um, especially in today's sort of like condition where, you know, police departments and fire departments, EMS are understaffed, like they're having trouble, like just keeping the, the lights on. The last thing they, they have bandwidth for is like long term strategic planning. Um, so you can come in and do that. And you just continue to do that and build experience, build knowledge. Obviously, take all your incident command system courses, start 100, uh, 700, 800, uh, then 200, 300, 400. 400 is kind of like a, a wash for most of us, uh, but it's good to have. Uh, ultimately, that's a couple day course. 300 was the one that sort of like when I took it, I was like, oh, like this is how it all works together. Uh, 400 was like, oh man, if this ever gets to this situation. Uh, well, the instructor was like, the thing about area command is never use area command. Uh, and I was like, oh boy, yeah. So big incidents is much more complicated. On top of that, start to take advantage of things like the um, all of the national training centers that exist. Uh, you can go to you know schools where they just blow stuff up. You get to sit there and watch the FBI blow up cars and then learn about responding to that. You can go to uh, there's you know a school out in Hawaii which they used to pay to go out there for free. Uh, I don't think they I think you got to pay some of it now, but all this stuff is paid for by your tax dollars. You can just go there and take these courses. Um, Teeks, you know, huge national training. There's usually Teeks classes all over the place. Uh, you can look on their uh, website and track down classes. And then there's the Emergency Management Institute. That's FEMA's like you know academy essentially. Uh, and in fact, now they even have the basic and advanced, I think it's basic and advanced academies. And everyone that I know that's gone through it says it's amazing. It's like really, really cool. You have a cohort that you get to work through all, all the academy with. So you build these like teams and get really good relationships with the folks that are there. Um, and again, it's free. Um, you know, you have to sort of give up your salary of your whatever normal job to go down there and do that. Um, but if this is what you want to do and, and build out that resume, you can do that. Again, CEM is sort of the like, it's it's the standard certif. You know, you want to be a certified emergency manager. CEMs run through the International Association of Emergency Managers, but it's really expensive. You have the uh, you know two hundred dollar um, you know annual fee, and then you got to pay for the the actual test and everything. It can get really expensive, but you know when you're talking about investing in yourself. Uh, not that much money considering you could potentially get, you know, an entire career out of this. Um, and I love IEM. I love, uh, the CM. I actually do not have my CM. I have a state certification, uh, as an emergency manager, but I do not have my CEM yet. I have everything in place. I just, I haven't pulled the trigger on it. Um, the other stuff is, is look at like other unique trainings. So we have the dynamic populations training, um, down in Orlando, like there's a lot of courses that exist that like aren't necessarily your traditional courses and um, can give you exposure to things that you wouldn't otherwise. And so if you search for emergency management training, you know, look, look around, see what's out there. There's just so much opportunity now. This is not a like niche field, like we're really becoming important. Uh, you know, there's private sector positions opening up like that was such a rare thing for a long time. And now there's like multiple fields within the private sector. Uh, as far as emergency management, public sector, uh, you know, you've got federal, you've got county, you've got, um, you know, local. Uh, there's even the, the volunteer groups like Team Rubicon. I love Team Rubicon. That's another awesome organization. You can uh, join up and uh, build a ton of experience, um, you know, responding with them. Uh, they, I just saw they were hiring for, you know, an emergency management position, one of their uh, division uh, chiefs. Um, so there's just a lot of opportunity out there. You just have to build uh, your, you know, get that network built out, get that base training uh, done, make those relationships, start to just do it. Like, that's the biggest thing. Don't let your, like, brain hold you back. Like, we're all going to be like, I can't do this. Uh, I'm not I'm not experienced enough. I, I don't have the knowledge. Uh, no one does when they start out. Like, just do it. Like, just throw yourself into it. Find some way where you can't talk yourself out of it. Sign up for something. Sign up for deployment. Uh Anytime there's a disaster, FEMA is looking to send people, the private sector is looking to fill people because sometimes they just need, you know, warm bodies to fill seats to do paperwork. Um, and that's a great opportunity. You could deploy for, you know, two weeks to a year uh, or more. I think there was some uh, FEMA reservists that, um, you know, deploy for like two, they'll do like two, three years at a time. Um, you know, do if you're young and or you don't have the sort of like commitment to, a, to keep you in one spot, um, do the... Uh, um, you know, disaster tourism thing. Just go from disaster to disaster around the country and get that experience. Um, if anyone has thoughts, definitely let us know in the comments. 
Please like, subscribe, give us a thumbs up, give me feedback on what you thought about this. Uh, this is all sort of based on a presentation I gave a few years ago, um, but I'm talking really fast, so I covered a lot of stuff really, really quickly. Um, if you want me to do more of this stuff and maybe go more in depth, uh, let me know. And uh, like I said, like, subscribe, uh, give us the ratings, thumbs up, comment, do all that stuff, and uh, we'll see you next week. 